I'm going to talk about today is what we do to help our own employees and those in our community get and stay healthier. And I'm going to talk first um, and primarily about atherosclerosis or heart disease. Um, the, we say to our employees, avoid um, the first three food felons, which as you can see are sugar, syrups, and simple carbohydrates. Why? Because they raise your blood sugar, and blood sugar does bad things to your proteins. And let me show you what it does. So this is the inside of a blood vessel, and these cells are endothelial cells. They're the cells that line the blood vessel. What keeps these cells stuck together is a protein. That protein is a variant of phosphokinase 3. What happens when sugar gets on it? When sugar gets on it, it weakens that grout. It decreases the, uh, if you will, the ability of one cell to stick to another. So then when blood pressure comes down, it pounds and it causes a tear. You know that sugar affects proteins because hemoglobin A1C is the way we measure type 2 diabetes. And all that is is a hemoglobin with the sugar, with the sugar at the A1C position. What that does is it also denudes the ability of that hemoglobin to function well, meaning that hemoglobin can't offload oxygen normally. Well, the same thing occurs with this protein. It weakens the bond, and so you then repair it. Your repair system is automatic in the human body. Why? because we want to keep blood inside the blood vessels. So over long periods of time, we've evolved an automatic repair system, and you put down LDL cholesterol. That's that yellow stuff. So that's a repair mechanism, but it's the start of atherosclerosis. So there are three components of atherosclerosis, which I'll show you. So the first is weakening the junction, which causes you to lay down LDL because the sugar got on the protein. The second thing is over years, you get inflammation behind that, and then all of a sudden, bango! With inf acute inflammation, you rupture the plaque, you get these triangles called platelets uh, uh, attached to it. They all attract a lattice network of clotting factors, and together they cause stoppage of those red cells. And whether it's a heart attack, or wrinkle, or stroke, or impotence, or memory loss, it's the same process. It's just a different blood vessel. So whether you have a wrinkle on your skin or whether you have a heart attack, just matters which blood vessel is occluded by that plaque rupturing. But what were the three steps? The three steps were sugar gets on a protein, so a high blood sugar level is associated with it. Then you get chronic inflammation because you've turned on inflammatory genes or you've got hepatic fat behind it causing inflammation. And the third phase was an acute inflammation, which is the rupturing of the plaque. And that's the genesis of heart attacks, strokes. It's also the genesis of wrinkles. So that's why we say to do it. Can you do it with moderation in food? Well, the problem in moderation in food is you have to stay below a blood sugar level of 110. Is that possible? Yeah. If you have a, a soda, it's two ounces of the soda. So when's the last time you saw a kid have a 20 ounce soda and split it with 10 of his friends? Just doesn't happen that often. For the blood sugar in the kidney or in the brain, it's a blood sugar level of 250. You don't get that unless you have um, diabetes usually. So in fact, that's why strokes are much more, com that's why heart attacks are much more common than strokes or than, in fact, um, kidney failure from vascular disease. The point I'm saying is food is not let's make a deal. Until we can get society to do away with all the sugar in the food, the added sugar, we aren't going to win this battle in America. And it's an important battle. But at the Cleveland Clinic, we've taken all the sugared beverages out. By the way, when we stopped hiring smokers, I got three death threats. They were from different mailboxes in Cleveland, they were handwritten, um, and we tried to trace where they were. My office got moved, so it was less easy to hit me with a rifle. Um, when we took out sugared beverages, we got 75 death threats, but they were emailed in. We knew who had sent them. 
Um, so the point is that we in America don't do away with sugar very easily. Why is this so important for our country? Well, when I was a senior in medical school, we spent 7.2% of gross domestic product, this dates me, I'm 66. So in 1970, when I was a senior in medical school, um, we spent 7.2% of our gross domestic product, and we had to take a course called healthcare financing. None of us medical students wanted to take it, but the economics professor who came over from Berkeley said, we spent 7.2% this year, that's up from 5.2% in 1960. If we keep going at that rate, we'll hit 12% and lose our manufacturing base. And he said, why will we lose our manufacturing base? And he said, because we're four times as expensive as Mexico. We didn't know anything about India, China, or Japan in 1970. And he said, when it gets to 12%, the differential will be 9% with Mexico. When the differential is 8%, manufacturing moves. Well, we beat that. We hit 12% in 1990, and we lost our manufacturing base. Now, part of it is we're lowering the cost of oil so we can get some of that back. But in fact, medical costs are one of the major drivers of that. And we're much worse off. We're going to hit, last year we spent 18.3% of our gross domestic product, and we will hit 20 to 28%. We can't do that, because if we hit this, we lose all the service industries. We lose all education, all insurance, et cetera. Anything that isn't absolutely local moves at a differential cost of 20%. So we will not be allowed to hit this. That's why, actually, when um, they talk about bending this curve down, that's so important to do. We won't hit this because we won't be allowed to lose all those jobs. So we will either get rationing. You can't get this drug. You can't get that procedure. Or we will get rational. What do I mean by that? Well, the reason we are twice as expensive as Europe or four times as expensive as India, China, Japan, and Mexico is we have twice the chronic disease of Europe, four times, more than four times that of India, China, Japan, and Mexico. So we have in the United States, we have 80% more high blood pressure than Europe, same ages, 40, 55 to 65, same uh, diagnostic criteria. 110% more heart disease, 40% more type 2 diabetes, 800% more stroke. If you will, even when you look at cancer, 5.4% in Europe from 55 to 65, 12.2% in the United States. 21.3% of arthritis, 53.8%. The only one we're better at is osteoporosis. And why is that? Because we weigh more, which strengthens our bones. But everything else, we have more of. The good news is four factors, and you've already seen them in what they cause in atherosclerosis, cause 75% of the disease. Tobacco, food choices and portion size, physical inactivity, and stress. These three things are what cause us to have that high blood sugar, are what cause us to have chronic inflammation, and what cause us to have acute inflammation. And that's what we have to stop, if you will, if we're going to be competitive for jobs. If you look at what those four factors cause in, 19, in 2007, 81% of hospitalizations, 91% of all prescriptions, 76% of physician visits at an average cost of $6,000. So if you smoke, he's paying for it. Because in America, we share insurance costs by the state. And so if you guys lived in the same state, and you smoke, he's paying your costs, some of them. And if he has a lot of stress and doesn't know how to manage it, you're paying some of his costs. That's how the insurance pool works. The problem is we, as an average, are paying $6,000 more per person over the age of 18 in America than we have to pay. $1.5 trillion is wasted. That's what we're talking about, and that's what this whole group here really can do something about. In fact, the CBO, before the sequestration, did the estimated cost for the next 70 years. And this was assuming a 2% growth rate. And you'll notice, everything in blue goes down as a percent of GDP for the next 70 years. And that's everything non-health related, including disability and Social Security. If we grow at 2% a year, we don't have a budget problem. We don't have any problem. 
except for with health. And that's why health care is such a big issue. That's why, in fact, all of you are really here, because it is stopping that cost spiral that all of you want to do something about. Now, this was a picture that isn't showing up, but it was of Dr. Oz and a guy named Rocco. There's Rocco. And he had type 2 diabetes, hypertension, and osteoarthritis. Um, and in fact, over a one month period, 28 days, we got him to reverse his type 2 diabetes, his hypertension, and it was two months for his hypertension and osteoarthritis. And he pulled 40% of the plaque out of his coronary arteries over 11 months. And I'm sorry I can't show you that video, but we'll put it online. Can we put it online, Lachlan? I don't know whether Lachlan, we can put it online. But anyway, we'll try and get it online. But in any case, the point is, he reversed it with some basic things. Did he lose the genes for type 2 diabetes? No, he just turned them off. Did he lose the genes for hypertension or osteoarthritis? No, he just turned them off. And that's really what we've learned in the last three months is you get to control your genes. What do I mean by the last three months? Well, remember, each of us has about 22,000 genes, but it's only about 10% of our DNA, and no one knew what the rest of the DNA was. Well, in the last three months, we found out 80% of the 90% of the rest of the DNA is switches. That is switches that you turn on or off. And what excites me is some simple things may be able to turn those switches on and off and you'll see why I think, in fact, the odd omegas, um, both omega-3 and omega-7, influence those switches so greatly. Well, we'll come back to that in a second. Rocco reversed 90% of his risk. If he had been any place else, other than in a disease reversal center, he would have had coronary bypass surgery because he had 97% lesions of his coronary arteries. So the second thing we take away from people is fried food. They can bring it in at the Cleveland Clinic, but we don't serve it. We don't have any fryers there. Why? Because it causes that chronic inflammation. That is the saturated fat, and if you have trans fat in it, it does it too. Those fats in that fried food cause your liver to accumulate fat. We have gone from, if you will, 10% fatty liver in 1990 to in 2004, 35% to the current estimate is 60% of Americans have that. That causes the chronic inflammation that causes, if you will, those plaques to swell up that you saw in the video. So we take this, we took all fryers out. We have 43 fryers for sale if anyone wants to buy them. We have a, a lot of places. If you've got an enemy, good Christmas gift, give them a fryer. Um, but there is no redeeming feature in that. They cause chronic inflammation, and they cause that by turning on your genes. We now know that one of the things that turns on inflammatory genes is those saturated and trans fat. And I can't show you this well enough because of the lighting in here, but these are 52 guys with prostate cancer, and these are their gene arrays. And here they are before the intervention, and here they are after the intervention. And if you look at it, in this lower quadrant, they're largely red. What does that mean? It means they're largely turned on and making proteins. And here, over in this quadrant, the same 52 guys, they're largely green. What are these five genes that they turned off by that intervention? Those are the RAS family of genes that promote the growth of prostate, breast, and colon cancer. So these guys, by this intervention, what was the intervention? It was getting rid of the sugar and getting their blood sugars down to normal. It was getting rid of saturated and trans fat. And it was getting rid, it was walking 10,000 steps a day. It was meditating 15 mor minutes morning and night. And the three guys who smoke quit smoking. And of the 52 guys here, only one has progressed in seven and a half years to need more than that those things for, re for treating their prostate cancer. By the way, up here that are green and turn red, these two produce the GSTM1 protein that cause colon, breast, and prostate cancer cells to commit suicide. 
This is the view of it. This is a prostate. You probably aren't old enough to have had a rectal exam yet. Have you had a rectal exam? No. Have you had a rectal exam for prostate cancer? For prostate, you have. Did they use one or two fingers? Five. Well, do you know why they use two fingers? Why some docs use two fingers versus one finger? Second opinion. <laughs> I, I love that. I can't resist it. Sorry. Um, anyway, this is what they're feeling for. And it's the same thing with breast, if you will. This is a rubbery substance, and this, where the tumor is, is hard. This is a radiograph, obviously, on a, a radiation scan. And here it is again um, a year later. And in fact, only one of the 52 guys has progressed beyond this in the seven and a half years, as opposed to 29 in the control group. And the reason is what you're doing with these, with those changes, is you're controlling which genes are on and not. Now, we're in, La we're in Las Vegas, so I love to talk about the king. What was the king's major contribution? John, do you know? You've forgotten. Well, his major contribution was he got immunized on TV. And that's the Surgeon General giving him a polio vaccine. Prior to that, 0.3%, less than half of 1% of us had gotten vaccinated against polio. Um, Elvis got it on TV. That's the Surgeon General giving it to him. It's the first shot the Surgeon General ever gave. That's the head nurse in the public health service standing by. She's standing by in case the Surgeon General passes out. But in any case, he wiped out polio because within eight months, 83.2% of us eligible for polio vaccine got it. And so Elvis wiped out polio and he saves us $55 billion a year in not caring for people with um, polio. So I say one of the things I tell people is get their flu shots and immunizations. Why? Because the major benefit of flu shots is decreased chronic inflammation. If you get a flu shot every year for 10 years, you decrease your chances of dying in the next 10 years by 50% because you wipe out chronic inflammation. That is the major thing that flu does for us is cause a chronic inflammation that lasts a long time. It's the same thing secondhand smoke does. If you go to secondhand smoke-free environments, you decrease heart attacks by 20%, 30%, and decrease sudden deaths by 20%. What does that similarly? Well, I'm going to show you some, if you will, supplements that do that. But whether you're in Ohio and have a 30% decrease in ED visits, or whether you're in Pueblo, Colorado, a 27% decrease, or whether you're in Piedmont, Italy, and have a 10% reduction in 12 months, or whether you're in Scotland, sorry, Lachlan, there's nothing in Ireland, whether you're in Scotland and have a 17% reduction, um, or whether you're in Indiana and have a 77% reduction in the non-smokers, what you do by having non-smoking rules is you wipe out chronic inflammation in that population. And by the way, the last one is in Minnesota, in 18 months, a 33% reduction in sudden deaths. So what are the things to decrease medical costs? Well, I've shown you that the key is decreasing inflammation and plaque rupture. And you stop the building of plaques by decreasing blood sugar. You stop inflammation by getting rid of hepatic fat, and you stop acute inflammation by turning off the genes. So why do we say take five pills or maybe eight? Because they've been demonstrated to contribute to those things. So the first one is the DHA and omega-3. DHA is the active component in the brain where it's been shown to decrease memory loss. Why do I say take it in a pill versus food? Because the only fish in America that we serve on our tables that have omega-3s consistently are salmon and trout. The rest of them that we farm for humans, not that you get for making pills, but that we farm have been learned to eat corn and soy meal and have omega-6s in them. So the only fish that consistently have it, and most people don't eat enough salmon and trout, which is why I say eat 
DHA 900 milligrams. Vitamin D3, when we tested it at our own institution, 50 to 87 percent are deficient at a level of 20, which is the level for uh, bone. In fact, the goal we aim for is 50 to 80, and when we test it in our own physician population, a healthy population, over 80 percent are deficient in it. So we don't know all the things it does. We do know it turns on your proofreader gene. So every one of you in every cell but your red cells has a proofreader gene. That proofreader gene, it's called the P53 gene, is in charge of reading the rest of your gene. And if there's a typographical error, remember there are only four letters, A, C, T, and G. If there's a typographical error, that proofreader gene is in charge of either correcting it or killing the cell. Well, what turns it on is vitamin D. The third thing is calcium 600 milligrams and magnesium 400 milligrams. Why do we tell this to our um, patients to do this? Because you need about 1,200 milligrams of calcium. More than 600 from supplements increases your risk. So we want to get them 600 from supplements. Why do we give them magnesium? Because if all they have is the calcium, they will get bloated or constipated and not like us. Why a half of a multi twice a day? because a full multi is too much at once and you will urinate out the water-soluble components. So we spread it out over twice a day and it's really an insurance policy against an imperfect diet. How many of the employees of the Cleveland Clinic have an imperfect diet? It's around 90%. So even at a place that's a healthcare organization, we have a lot. We have it half because you may urinate its soluble components out it decreases, and the recent study was in men, and these were really healthy men, it decreased the incidence of non-prostate cancers by 8% at age 50 and above, and by 18% age 70 and above. And this is a very healthy group. They, 70% of them exercised three times a week. Um, only 3.7% of them smoked and their average BMI was 26. So you'd expect it to have less effect in them than in the general population. That's why we say take half a multi. There are two other groups that really should take a multi every day, and one is prenatal people. And what do, if you're between the ages of 12 and 50, and you're a female, you're prenatal. Um, because 50% of pregnancies in America happen unexpectedly, and you need it three months in advance of your getting pregnant. Why is that? Because you decrease congenital birth defects if you take it within the first three months and continually by 80%. You decrease childhood cancers if you start it within three months and take it for the rest of pregnancy. But the reason you need it in advance is it's the only thing we know that decreases autism risk. And so taking it three months before pregnancy decreases autism risk and autism spectrum disorders by about 40%. It also, when combined with DHA, looks like it improves outcomes, IQ outcomes, based on sibling studies by about six. That is just a small amount, but a significant amount. If you're over the age of 55, you want a multivitamin too just as a, if you will, because of the decreased memory loss and the decreased eyesight. The fifth thing we say is aspirin, and it's two baby aspirin with a half a glass of warm water before and afterwards. Why? Because aspirin decreases nine cancers, including breast cancer in women, ovarian cancer in women, colon cancer in both men and women, esophageal cancer, et cetera, by about 40 percent. Um, it has side effects, that's why you should talk to your doc about this one, but take it with a glass of warm water before and afterwards. Why? Because 70 percent of the side effects of aspirin are landing on your stomach lining, causing gastric upset and gastric bleeding. So you want to land in the water where it will dissolve. So you don't want enterocoded, you want two baby aspirin that land in water and dissolve quickly. How fast does it affect? And this is, we only have time course of effect on really three things. Exercise, food, and aspirin. And all have the same time course of benefit. 
That is, in about six months, we see outcome difference. This is the percent of people with colon and rectal cancer. They started at age 65. This is two baby aspirin versus placebo. And you see in half a year, you have fewer, asp fewer cancers in the aspirin group. And by three years, you're getting 90% of the effect as if you took aspirin your whole life. What that means is you get a do-over. Why do you get a do-over? Because your cells change and you change both the protein effects and the gene effects over a three-year period. The other three are a probiotic, maybe a non-blood brain barrier passing statin and CoQ10 and omega-7. The probiotic, all we really have the data for is if you're pregnant or breastfeeding or if you've taken an antibiotic. And in those cases, there's really good data that a probiotic decreases um, your overall risk of disease. A non-blood brain barrier and st passing statin and CoQ10, that's either Lipitor or Torvastatin or Crestor and, uh, or Rosuvastatin and CoQ10. Why those two? Because those get across. Those do not get across the blood brain barrier. And what happens? They decrease Alzheimer risk. We don't know why, but in three studies. So everything I've talked to you about before this has at least four studies in humans. The ones in yellow have only three studies in humans or not enough data in humans. And if you will, the statins, we've been waiting for about six years for the fourth study. We don't have a fourth study yet, but the data is pretty convincing that this actually works. Um, and the last one is omega-7. Um, I told you there were three components of plaque formation. High blood sugar, chronic inflammation caused by liver fat usually, and acute inflammation. And omega-7 um, seems to antagonize or reverse all three. So the first of these was a crossover study of 30, 18 to 53-year-olds on either the American Heart Association Step 1 diet or that diet plus the omega-7 as a monosaturated fat. And what happened? There was an improved ratio of lousy LDL to healthy HDL cholesterol. There was a substantially improved ratio of triglycerides to healthy HDL cholesterol. And both are important beneficial changes in decreasing that chronic inflammation. In mice with, with genetic type 2 diabetes, in a study reported last year, it reduced insulin resistance. And obviously, that increases blood sugar. Saturated fat causes that. This monounsaturated fat decreases it. So in mice with two, type 2 diabetes, reduced insulin resistance. It reduced liver fat. It kept the blood sugar low. It reduced the triglyceride levels, again, a reflection of reducing liver fat. And it suppressed pro-inflammatory gene expression. So it did exactly those three things in these mice that you'd want it in your body, that is to decrease, if you will, plaque development and plaque rupture. In adults in the cardiovascular health study reported by Mozafian et al., um, it, the exogenous omega-7 was associated with reduced body fat and increased HDL cholesterol lower triglycerides and lousy LDL cholesterol and lower inflammatory markers. They use C-reactive protein. So again, all of these things with omega-7, this is an epidemiologic study. They looked at people, the 3,736, they looked at who had taken the most omega-7 in. And the groups with the most omega-7 had a reduced, if you will, component of uh, metabolic syndrome. So substantially lower risk of diabetes of more than 55% in the highest quintiles of take. That's as good as you can get. Um, that's epidemiologic. We don't have randomized control data yet. And this is actually why I got involved in this. Mark Penn, who a, was a researcher at Cleveland Clinic and went to another institution, asked me to take a look at the data on this. He tried this um, with the purified um, palmitoleic acid 
Purified meaning it had no palmitic acid with it, so it was purified to have just palmitoleic acid. The palmitic acid, which is the omega, it's the seven form of this, it's a, a C16, but without the monounsaturated fat, actually causes fat accumulation. So you want to get that out. And this was the purified palmitoleic acid without the palmitic. And he studied it in knockout mice who have propensity for atherosclerosis. And what happened? It again increased HDL, but it radically reduced, and this was a surprise, by more than 50% plaque. So the animals were two groups. One group got the purified palmitoleic acid and their normal diet. The other group just got their normal diet. And what happened? The group that got the palmitoleic acid had more than a 50% reduction. I don't know if you can see this, but this is the aorta of those animals. And it's Sudan 5 staining, so the red indicates plaque. And you compare this one, which is a typical one of the animals that just got the diet for three months, and this one, which got the diet plus the palmitoleic acid and the purified palmitoleic acid, and there is 70% or 80% less atherosclerosis if you got the omega-7. So that's why I say this is what, in fact, I take. Why? Because there's no risk in it, and there is probable benefit. Now, we need more human data, and um, I understand from um, Tursus Pharmaceuticals, which is the uh, developer of this, that there will be more human data. I disclosed my conflicts. Um, I did um, ask them if I could join the scientific advisory board that they have so that I can help design the studies. Um, I did write these books, and I do earn a royalty on them, so I hope you buy them. Um, I did start the Real Age website. Um, I do have a radio show on uh, a whole bunch of stations. And this is a worldwide concern. Veja is the national magazine of Brazil. She's obviously concerned about aging. I've been on the cover of it five times. If you're a guy, you can't find me. I'm way up there. <laughs> Didn't see me, did you? <laughs> um, so the, the question is, why is it such a small dose that seems to have such a big effect? Right, and wouldn't you overcome that by just the palmitic acid naturally present in the average diet? Yeah, um, we don't know the answer to your question. But the mice and the other human study had a relatively normal human American diet. Um, why was the palmitoleic acid so effective at decreasing both hepatic fat and insulin resistance? We don't know. It probably has an effect on a specific gene. And so it's turning on that gene that probably is the effective, that pro, it's probably blocking the pro-inflammatory gene or turning on an anti-inflammatory gene that's probably the effect of the palmitoleic, the monounsaturated omega-7. Again, is uh, the purified version that much more important than, I, uh, there's other sources, right? There's sea buckthorn, there's coconut yeah, oil Yeah, it looks so like, forth. it looks like the palmitic acid causes liver fat accumulation and over time will result in that chronic inflammation of atherosclerosis. So my own belief is it's probably that important, but I don't know that for sure. Could you compare omega-3 and omega-7? Yeah, the question is, would I compare omega-3 with omega-7? And the answer is omega-3 has an anti-inflammatory effect but doesn't have an anti-insulin resistance or an anti-hepatic fat effect. So they probably work by different mechanisms. So when, uh, meaning omega-3 probably has an anti-inflammatory effect, and there are a number of anti-inflammatory genes. We don't know which ones it works on yet. Omega-7 has an anti-inflammatory effect similarly, but we don't know if it's the same mechanism. But omega-7, in addition, has an anti, if you will, insulin resistance or pro-decreasing blood sugar effect and has a decrease in acute inflammatory gene effect or hepatic fat accumulation effect as well. 
So omega-7 has, we, I think, my best guess is it works by a different mechanism than omega-3, and the two will be useful together rather than just separately. Um, you're going so fast I may have missed it, but um, are the human clinical studies underway and when do you expect to have results? Um, there are human clinical studies. I would guess the results will be within a year from now and probably sooner, but within a year from now. Is that... Uh, are there any current studies or will there be any studies comparing omega-3s to 7s to see if there's a significant difference? Are there randomized controlled trials of omega-3 to 7? I don't know of any. Um, you know of any? No. There's none. There's none in the in a um, either a library of medicine or in a in in, a, in national library of medicine PubMed search or in a Google search. So I can tell you there aren't any in those searches. I don't know that any haven't been done by one of the companies here that haven't been published yet.